through the aha councils with multiple expertise woven into a strong core, the people established Lokahi. And the result of Lokahi was Pono, the spiritual balance in all things. The aha represents the binding and the Pono that is created for the man that will sustain life. This prepares the way spiritually for the man physically. So it's like you got a kahea for that. You got a kahea for Aino Mubona. You have to envision it first and then it will become Mubona. Um, the Aha, this prepares the way spiritually for the land physically. The manifestation of Polo is the land and people flourishing abundantly with food and many descendants. And this comes from the understanding of the concept of the Aha. So at this slide, of the fish pond, uh, this is Kiawaluni fish pond, and there was a scene that was unique to Mokai, Aya na Kaipo Olo 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 Mokai. There are the turbulent seas of Mokai. And basically, it it talked about the, the fish pond being so fat, so mumona with fish, that the waters would churn on the inside. The sea inside the fish pond was more turbulent than the sea outside of the fish pond. So that was the kind of abundance that our kupuna strove for, and that was what is true sustainability, is aina momona. Um, so how, how did the councils make their decisions? They had eight rounds of decision making, and one was moana nuia kea, the farthest out to sea or along the ocean's horizon, one could perceive from a top to the highest vantage point in this area. So as far as you can see to the horizon, that's, how, that's where the kupuna would manage. And all the decisions have to make sure that they never pollute that water, they never do anything bad to whatever they could see to the horizon from the highest place. Kahakai Pepeau, where the high tide is to where the left water soil starts. This is typically the splash zone where the crab, limo, and, o and limo and opihi may be located. Sea cliffs are a gentle shoreline dotted with a coastal strand of vegetation. Sands where turtles and seabirds nest or extensive sand dune. Environs like Mo'omomi in the northwest of Mokai that expand upward all the way to the mountains. So that's Kahakai Pepeau. You gotta worry about that, that zone too. Mauka, from the point where the lepo, where the soil starts to the top of the mountains. Nabuliwai, all the sources of fresh water, ground, artesian water, rivers, streams, springs, including springs along the coastline that mix with the seawater. So, so, you know, whether you're going to do an um, <coughs> cesspool or whatever, they're going to poison the waters, the Aha Council would go, it is thumbs down, you know? So all these things they worried about. Kalevalani, everything above the land, the air, the sky, the clouds, the birds, the rainbows. So you, you look, Clean Air Act, you know, they, they, they give emission standards. Arkupuno probably would say zero emissions, you know? Um, Kanaka Honua, the natural resource is important to sustain people. However, management is based on providing for, for the benefit of the resources themselves rather than from the standpoint of how they serve people. Papahe Lolona, the knowledge and intellect that is a valuable resource to be respected, maintained, and managed properly. This is the knowledge of the kahuna, the astronomers, the healers, and other carriers of Ike. So what you know is important too, and you have to keep that knowledge a secret. Um, Keihi'ihi, elements that maintain the sanctity or sacredness of certain places. So the think of like Mauna Kea, it's sacred to all Hawaiians. You know, so how much telescopes going on that mountain? You know, it's not about the environmental impact per se, it's, it's are you removing the sacredness of that place. So those were the eight realms of decision making and ethics that the Ahas applied. And they, they likely recognized that more 
More than just good intentions were necessary for making sound decisions. The AHA as a collective considered every idea along the eight realms of decision making. Potential solutions were weighed according to how beneficial or detrimental they were to each realm. If a proposed solution was determined to be good overall to each of the realms, then that measure was adapted, adopted for implementation. So Kumujan Kaimikawa expressed that the wise management resulted in lokahi, the balance between the land, the people that lived upon the land, and Akua, the gods. In turn, lokahi manifested Pono, the spiritual balance in all things. So this manao was shared to me by Dr. Kavika Winters, who was um, halal, um, part of Kumujan's halal. So many of the things that we feel you know, in our hearts and in our na'al, what is right and what is wrong, really comes from these principles that the aha um, made their decisions. And so these councils were organized according to moku. So this is, for example, this is Oahu. You know, and there, that's their various moku. Um, and the island itself is a moku puni. So what had happened was the management was so so uh, effective that the population flourished and the resources flourished and there's Aina Momona all over the place. So, so then the councils got together again and said, we gotta, we got to further divide these moku into Ahupua. And so these are sm smaller land divisions within the moku. And so the councils became from Aha Moku to Aha Ahupua. But if a decision or an issue um, concerned the entire moku, then the aha moku would convene. If it, if it involved the entire island, then all the aha councils for each moku would convene. But if, if an issue just affected that ahupua'a, then the experts within that ahupua'a would be um, the ones that made the decisions. Okay? So now you see why we're so attached to our piece of aina. You know, it could be like one one mile long stretch, but the most special place on earth for us. You know, and and that's that's why because of how the land was divided. Okay, so Ahupua'a, they were not all watersheds. So this is again some of the simplistic ways of defining Ahupua'a kind of removes that cultural part and the essence, but. These are some of the things about Ahupua. Um, you know, and Ahupua runs from the sea to the mountain, the typical, and contains a sea, fishery, and beach, a stretch of open, cultivable land, and higher up is forest. Inland and shore fish ponds are included within its boundaries. Um, that's according to the Kamakana case. And it looked back to what, what was those principles. When we look at the boundaries of Pulehunui case, a principle very largely ob obtaining in these divisions of territory Ahupua'a was that a land should run from the sea to the mountains, thus affording to the chief and his people a fishery residence at the warm seaside together with products of the highlands. So why am I saying this? Why is this important? Nowadays, the understanding of Ahupua'a is just at the end on the shoreline. But actually, the Ahupua included the near shore fisheries. So, when we start talking about where our rights are included, we also got to think about the fisheries, not just the, the land. Okay, um, <clears throat> so, I just wanted to share a little bit about what Kumu John had expressed regarding um, the, oh, sorry, the, uh, the effect of, of this um, management. And basically he said, um, after the passing of the first seven generations under the Aha Councils, peace was established. By the 16th generation, there was no more manufacture of weapons and no knowledge of war amongst the people. The leadership of the Aha Councils was so proficient in providing the, for the people's needs 
that everyone had enough food, materials for housing and clothing. There were no rich, no poor. Because of the Aha Councils, the people were able to progress and expand their farming and fishing abilities and excel spiritually. About 300 years after the formation of the Aha Local Councils, the land became abund abundant and the population of the islands exploded. So basically, so you can see like, with this kind of wise management, what you don't see is Aina Mumuna. So if you like know if you're being a Pono leader and you like know if the Aina is okay and the people are okay, just say Aina Mumuna. Flourishing people, flourishing land. Okay? So some of the ways that they are Kupuna sort of manage these sort of biocultural zones was looking at it from the terms of the, the Vau. So Vau Akua was the realm of the gods, and that was the upland, the upland forest gathering the rains, the sacred place of the gods. And, you know, most people wouldn't access that area, or maybe only like bird catchers. And if you needed occasionally uh, some core to make a canoe. Mm -hmm. So I was hearing somebody talking about the name of their rain, and, and that the, the, the rain comes from the ocean, the trade winds going up. So you see our kupuna were so wise, they already know all this stuff. So they said, Vawakua, leave it alone, God dwelling of the gods. Vawnahele, you know, this was the perpetual rainforest where giant trees and tree ferns grew um, <clears throat> under perpetual cloud and rain. So this is a saturated forest just below the clouds. Um, where human access is difficult and rare. And so so this was an area too that was kind of tough. Um, the areas where where the people inhabited and utilized the most was the Vau Laau and the Vau Kanaka. So it's what our kupuna did was they, they grew certain hardwoods that were important for construction. They had they had really a food forest, so it looks like a looks like a natural forest, but certain certain crops were selected, um, but grown in such a way that it was you know, ecologically sound. So that's why I have a picture of this is a natural forest, and this is a for a food forest. You know, so you got all your the wood for building, you got all your fruit trees, all these kind of things. So. The Vaula all was important. And then the Vau Kanaka was, you know, where a lot of the land was being cultivated. That's where you see the Tara terraces. And what's essentially happening is the small Akupuna um, would build these terraces along the contour of the land and slow the flow of the water so that spring lines would um, be created below. So if you think of the realms of decision making again, right? Namui Wai. It's like, how can we make more water? You know, how can we make Aino Mumuna? Well, we gotta, we gotta take care of this water as a precious resource, okay? And then the Valkanaka also included the ocean, the, the kahakai, the fish ponds, um, gathering opihi, limo, all these areas. Um, and Dr. Carlos Andrade, um, in his book about Haena and Kauai, says about the near shore fisheries, rather than being perceived as open range, free to being plundered and accessible to all, the inshore areas are cared for as if they were extensions of, of the gardens. You know, and in my work interviewing Kamaaina from Manae on the east side of Mokai, some of the stories I heard was, um, I think Miliana P telling me that there's different like reef patches that are named after women and if you're from that island you can you can trace matrilineally to certain reef patches that were named after your kupuna, your kupuna ahine. So these were tended like gardens and Carol, Carol will talk more about that. Um, so we were farmers of land and sea. 
And this is this is the fish pond at Ualapu'e, and these are all the keiki gathering on um, So this is this is a, this looks like over a thousand pounds of limu right now. So that's how productive we were. So and it, this shows you too that the kupuna were really great in understanding the divisions of the land. They named so so many divisions of the land. And all of this is you, you don't see one fence for them to figure out where each part is. It's by it's by their, their memory and by their observation, the keen observation and, and continual relationship in the man, with the man. So one one aspect of the Ahupua'a was the Ili. So there were some some Ahupua'a that they didn't have all the resources that was needed for the family. So you'd have like Ili Lele, like jumping, jumping Ili. It's just, Basically, a ili is a strip of land within the ahupua, or it may be a ili kupono, a ili that is um, sovereign upon its own self. But typically, the extended ohana lived in the ili, and so they would have a fishery residence, they would have a place to grow the taro, and they would have all kind of resources, things that they would need for, for construction. And, and um, access to you know, building materials. So, um, Mary Kavena Pukui talks about the. Um, my slides on my computer will pass out. Anyway, so she will talk about the Ohana Ko Kula Uka and the Ohana Ko Kula Kai and how they would. The Ohana Kokula Uka, they would be the ones wearing the taro, they would have they would have kappa, you know, they would be making certain things from the land and then they would exchange with the Ohana Kokula Kai, um, fish and, and things of that nature that was from the ocean, you know, limu, pihi like that. And that's how the Ohana supported each other. So these relationships are important to understand. Um, and then also they had names for the ocean, you know, down to Pueone, the um, beach, inshore, sand dunes, outer sandbar, the sandy edge of the sea. Kaipualena, the yellowish sea where streams flow in and, and the waters roil. Um, Kaipohola, a shallow sea inside the reef, the, the lagoons, the blue holes, that kind of area. Poina Nalu or Kaipoi, where the sea breaks, so that's the break that's right up, right where the reef, uh, where a wave hit the reef. Kai Uli, the deep blue sea. Kai Ele, the dark sea. Kai Polohua Mea Akane, purplish blue, reddish brown sea of Kane, designated the far reaches of the immeasurable sea. Yeah, so that's, that's how deep the Puna were in identifying the place. So at the I think the end of the ninth century, that's when the beginning of the Ali system began. And so um, there were some areas that were still kind of disorganized. So there's there's chance about famous Mo'i, famous chiefs that united their island and organized the land among these Moko and Ahupua'a. So one is Ma'ili Kukai on Oahu and Mano Kalanipo on Kauai. So there's all these songs and chants written up about them and how revered they were because they brought peace upon the land and, and they brought Aina Mumona. So, so then you gotta think of like these Aha councils as maybe the, the bottoms up kind of way of managing. And so Ohana, you know, each Ohana had their own haku, and they would organize each other, and they would make sure that their ahupa, their ili was productive. But what these um, ali'i did was they kind of created a centralized government. So it was the perfect uh, top-down and bottom-up process. And, um, you know, the, sometimes chiefs would fight each other, and, and um, you know, through conquest, conquest acquired territory. 
And so there would be a kalai aino, you know, a dividing up of the authority over this land. But typically the ahupa and the muku stayed the same. And so what was really the constant was the ohana. And each alihi, um, each alihi loyal chief that was part of the aha, um, the aha alihi, um, that were distributed authority over some of these ahupua, they were called ali ai ahupua, and then the ali ai ahupua would um, designate konohiki. So that's where this konohiki came, this konohiki understanding came. So if you looked at how Hawaiians governed themselves, you know the the po'o was the the head was the mo'i or the ali ihi, and then the the po'ohibi, the shoulders was the kahuna, um, and then you you said that the hands was was the kanaka kalai moku, um, lavai uh, you know, so the po'e, the people, the, the people were really the, the corpus, and then um, so you had the maka ainana um, supporting and creating the productivity on the land. And you have the po'o, the, govern, the governing structure being the ali. But the konohiki had a, a, the, this sort of expertise role. And Carlos Andrade, he kind of breaks down the name of konohiki. And kono is to invite, entice, induce, um, prompt. Hiki is something that can be done, like, oh, hiki no can do. So basically, the konohiki was, had to be kind of charismatic. He had to be able to, um, <clears throat> he had to be able to entice people to do the hana, right? So like fish pond, no can be built by one person. It, it's a tremendous, it takes a tremendous amount of labor to create a fish pond. So, the Mo'olelo in Molokai was all the fish pond rocks that you see all, all on the, the south shore, the protected shoreline of Molokai. Um, they came from the north shore, just 10 miles over the mountain and down this steep, steep poly. And human chains of, chains of seven people, seven people wide, men, women, and children passing stones. So all the mana of our kupuna is in each stone. So you don't need one you don't need one for organize that kind of stuff. So basically the konohiki had to be in this guy that could rally people and motivate 